Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I think we have people in all time zones. Um, so welcome to this first webinar in a two-part series on new technologies and methodologies for explosive ordnance risk education, uh, a view from other sectors. <clears throat> My name is Caitlin Hodge, and I'm an Explosive Ordnance Risk Education Officer at the Geneva International Center for Humanitarian Demining, and I'm going to be your moderator for this webinar. We're really glad that you've taken the time and your busy schedules to join us, and we're really grateful also to our panelists for their presence. It's exciting to see so many people from across the globe who are joining. We have people registered from over 40 countries, uh, so thank you and welcome. I have a few housekeeping notes uh, before we begin. The first is to say that all participants have been muted and cameras have been disabled to allow for enough bandwidth. So please type your questions uh, along the way in the Q&A feature, so questions and answer. It's an icon at the bottom of your screen. Um, this will be monitored and we'll choose a few questions to discuss after the end of the panelists' presentations. You can also use the chat feature to introduce yourself and we'll be using the chat to share information about the webinar. Finally, please be advised that this webinar is being recorded and we will share the link to the recording as soon as it is available afterwards. The title of this webinar series comes from a review that the GACHD conducted and published last fall on new technologies and methodologies for explosive ordnance risk education in challenging contexts. Our idea behind the webinar was to bring this publication to life, to share some key findings, and to expand on this publication even further. It's available online at eore.org, should be easy to remember, and it includes a dedicated resource library. So in that library, you can filter by type of resource, theme, language, country, and a bunch of other relevant criteria. The review has three chapters. Today's webinar will focus on a particular subset of methodologies from chapter two that enable us to dig deeper for deeper impact. Our speakers today bring a wealth of expertise on behavior change and communication for development. During the second webinar, we'll then look at digital tools for explosive ordinance risk education from chapter one of the review with speakers from UNICEF's U Report project, the Signpost Initiative, the World Health Organization, and locally-led innovations. Through both parts of this webinar series, we'll share key findings of the review, and most of all, we want to offer a platform for exploring these topics through the lens of other actors from sectors beyond mine action. We hope that the presentations will inspire risk education practitioners and contribute to the sector's uptake of good practices in digging deeper and going digital. Our format for today's webinar will be four consecutive 10 minute presentations by each of our four panelists, followed by a round of questions. The full panelist bios will be shared in the chat. We're aware that we won't be able to answer all of your questions today, but please send them in the Q&A anyway. We want to hear from you. We want to hear your experience. We want to see what elements need more research or attention and what we're not able to research uh, to answer today, we will try to revisit in written format after the webinar. So without further ado, let's begin. I'm pleased to introduce our first panelist, my colleague, uh, Mathieu Laruelle, who's an advisor on explosive ordnance risk education at the GICHD. He has over 15 years experience in mine action and his presentation will focus on key findings of this review with regards to social behavior change communication approaches used in the sector. Over to you, Matt. Thank you, Caitlin, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, before diving into the discussion uh, with our, our fellow panelists, Alessia, Fiona, and Jamie, um, let's look maybe briefly at what social and behavior change communication or SBCC is to set the scene and have a common understanding of what we're going to talk about in the next hour and a half. Behavior change communication or BCC, social and behavior communication, um, sorry, SBCC and communication for development, C4D, are probably terms that you've heard um, and that are often used interchangeably. 
slightly different definitions are used depending on organization and their focus. So the SBCC definition on the slide here is used by the Johns Hopkins Center for Communication Programs and taken from the Health Communication Capacity Collaborative HC3 project. And it basically says that SBCC refers to the use of communication to change behaviors by positively influencing knowledge, attitudes, and social norms. SBCC coordinates messaging across a variety of communication channels to reach multiple levels of society, thereby meaning individuals, communities, and eventually policy policymakers. So SBCC interventions are grounded in theory and evidence-based, and they follow a systematic process, analyzing the problem in order to define barriers and motivators, motivators to change, and then designing a comprehensive set of tailored interventions that will promote the desired behaviors. In a very similar way, I would say, to the design of EORE messaging, communication tools, and approaches. Now, before hearing from Alessa, Fiona, and Jamie, we wanted to share um, two examples of EORE interventions that we came across during our research and that have adopted a behavior change lens. And they're outlined in uh, chapter two, section B of the review. The review obviously only gives a snapshot of what was reported to us at a certain moment in time, and it's certainly not exhaustive. So if any of you attending this webinar implemented or are implementing risk education interventions through an SBCC lens, please do share your experience or links to any documents in the chat or in the International MRE Working Group, or just reach out bilaterally to Caitlin and myself. We, as, as Caitlin said, we want to hear from you and this is a platform to exchange. Now, the first example highlighted in the review is from Colombia, where over 500 new explosive organ casualties were recorded in 2019. The Barco Foundation developed an innovative risk education project called Pasos Seguros, or Safe Steps, it's based uh, on a partnership between a donor, discovery communications, a program that facilitates access to computers in schools, and the Barco Foundation that has years of experience in risk education. And basically based on an analysis of at-risk groups, um, the project targets different audiences through a mix of communication tools and platforms that all complement each other and complement other face-to-face -face interventions implemented by risk education operator. So it uses social media, it has TV clips, it has a video game, a mini series, an online training platform, and a website with general risk education content. And it evolves continuously um, over time. It's an interesting model in the, in, in the sense that it, it, it showcases uh, not only the importance of partnering with other sectors um, who have experience uh, in SBCC, C4D, um, but also it's an interesting experience uh, model, sorry, that, that shows how the repetition of messages across multiple platform can encourage and sustain positive behavior. Now, the second example is from the United Nations Mine Action Services uh, in Afghanistan from UNMAS, together with the Directorate of Mine Action Coordination, DMAC. Now, in 2019, they decided to review their approach to risk education in the country using an SBCC lens. Risk education, as you all probably know, had been implemented in the country for years, um, and explosive ordnance casualty numbers were still increasing. So the program decided to hire an SBCC expert um, to look at audience segmentation and how to best connect with each of these um, target audiences to change their behavior around explosive hazards. So the audiences were separate into girls, boys, women and men, and travelers. They then explored the different psychological, social, and environmental factors that uh, could be used to determine separate and targeted messaging, messaging for all these audiences. A complete report of, um, of this project is available uh, on the, in the resource library on eori.org, but I would like to invite Laramie Schuber from Magenta, Magenta Consulting, the social and behavior change agency that directly supported this project in Afghanistan to share some insights since we're lucky enough to have her on the call. So 
Tarami, over to you. Thank you for the introduction. Um, so Magenta has uh, worked in SBCC across many sectors in Afghanistan um, for years, but we only began working with UNMAS uh, in the past few years as the team did decide that they needed to shift their approach uh, to ER. When we came in and started to look at the risk education work that was being done, we were very surprised that it we were still using materials such as leaflets and chalkboard sessions. And given how far Afghanistan has come in terms of development, um, the risk education material just didn't match up with that. Um, as I said, Afghanistan has hugely developed and there are so many ways um, to reach uh, new audiences, whether it's in urbanized areas or uh, in rural parts of Afghanistan as well. The materials were quite technical and the messaging was quite negative. Um, so it wasn't succeeding in engaging Afghans in an emotional, humane and relatable way. And um, as Matthew just touched on, in order to know how to do that, you really need to understand um, the audience. So as he said, we conducted a very thorough analysis and segmentation to understand the motivations, um, the drivers, how they like to communicate, who their networks are. The strategy in general is to develop in a very participatory manner. Um, we worked uh, with UNMAS, of course, um, but with other stakeholders involved, such as DMAC and other mine action groups in the country. Um, and uh, so the outcome of this was not only a very rigorous strategy, but also a very nuanced and workable one. Um, it was also quite a rapid process. Um, it took around two months um, and cost less than $50,000. Um, and the smooth process was also you know, very much thanks to our strong partners at UNMAS, uh, who coordinated and, and facilitated a lot of the back and forth um, between us and the various stakeholders. Since we designed the strategy, we've continued working with UNMAS to um, design and execute campaigns based on that strategy so that an SBCC approach is uh, becoming mainstream through their EOR programming. Um, we've also begun working with UNMAS Iraq and you know, taking some of those um, best practices from there, for example, with regards to this idea of you know, behavioral fatigue when you're in a contracted conflict. I think in terms of our sort of lessons learned from the process, and I would actually apply that to all SBCC development, is that it's super important to not make assumptions about um, the audience. And this is why, you know, our thorough analysis and segmentation was such a core part of the process. And it just showed us again how many ways and how many tools there are to reach an audience. And that lesson learned is also what I would say it's the tip for SBCC programming as well. Um, you know, the best programs come from really understanding your audience um, and how to communicate with them and, and seeing them as very much part of the process um, and SBCC materials as part of a two way communication process uh, between you and your audience rather than just delivering information. Um, so I just want to end with just a couple of notes on the challenges. I mean, donor funding has meant that we haven't been able to implement the strategy as holistically as we would have liked. Um, and the implementation has been a little bit piecemeal, which means we haven't been able to get that continuity that we you know, really need for, for long-term impact. And I, I think this is a general challenge and the only way to start to combat this is to continue to educate donors around the importance of you know, a longer-term approach to behavioral change um, and also to be able to show them why it's important and the impact that it has as well. Thanks, Laramie. And that was, that was excellent, excellent insights um, and tips um, for everyone out there and, uh, and also highlighting the challenges uh, faced in, in implementing or adopting SBCC approaches in the ERE sector. Um, I will just conclude my this, this short um, presentation by, you know, and saying that through the review, we've seen um, that some of the most effective and efficient interventions for at-risk communities across sectors and across approaches were guided by some of the, the, the core principles of all the principles that you see on this slides um, that Laramie has also touched upon now. 
um, and I won't go into these. Um, the review has also shown that there is scope for much greater investment in ERE initiatives that are grounded in SBCC, and that ERE practitioners require more sharing of experience on existing initiatives, such as the one that Laramie just uh, explained. But we also need more resources and space to explore these new approaches within, within our own organizations and our own context. Um, and this is why we're all here, and, um, and, and I'm personally very excited um, to have other colleagues um, who will talk next uh, to share their experience. So that's all for me. Over to you, Caitlin. Thank you, Mathieu, and Laramie also for that interesting uh, presentation that I think has set the scene quite well. Um, I'd like to hand the floor now over to Alessia Radice who's a Communication for Development Specialist in UNICEF headquarters, currently supporting the child protection team. Lesio will share more on UNICEF's global approach to communication for development and how it's been operationalized for explosive ordnance risk education. Thank you very much, um, Caitlin, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Um, let me just share my presentation. Um, okay, so good morning. So my name is Alessia and I'm going to talk you through um, a more practical example of how we've applied some of the principles that um, Mathieu has uh, identified or explained um, in, in a setting which is Myanmar. Uh, but before that, I'd just to, like to go into a bit more detail as to um, how social and behavior change uh, operates. And I'll start that by, um, I'll do that by, giving uh, a little example. And I'm going to talk about um, some fish, like the fish in this pond. So um, in this pond, there's little fish and they live in this pond and they swim about. And what they eat, where they go in the pond, the parts of the pond that they use, what they do in the pond, very much depends on what is around them. So what they eat will very much depend on the food that falls in, on the weather outside, um, where they'll go and where they'll swim to will very much depend on where other animals are and on where all their little fish friends are and so on. So these little fish uh, are part of a much larger ecosystem and what they do is very much influenced by this larger uh, ecosystem, those close to them, but also the broader ecosystem like the weather outside. Um, and in a similar way, uh, we also do not live in isolation. We are very much uh, connected to everything and everyone that is around us. And what we do, what we think, what we feel, what we believe uh, will very much depend on those around us and the environment we live in. And I'm going to start by um, giving you an example of this little girl. This little girl is called Mia Mia, and she lives in Myanmar. And she goes to school and she loves learning. And uh, she's learned in school that she has to wash her hands uh, every time before eating and after going to the toilet. She understands that very well. And she does it very often, but sometimes she doesn't. She can't be bothered, so she doesn't. Um, she also knows that she needs to be kind to her little brother. She loves him very much, uh, but some, sometimes she's not very nice to him and she beats him up, although she knows that she will get into trouble. She will still be mean to him. In the same way, maybe her parents argue quite a bit and her father is quite violent to her mother and she knows from school that that is not correct. And she also knows that there is someone in the school that she can talk to about this and can help stop it. But despite knowing that this is wrong and despite knowing that she could go somewhere to get support, she chooses not to do it. So why is it that Mia Mia seems to know a lot of things? She knows she needs to wash her hands. She knows that hitting her brother is not okay. She knows that you know, violence in the household is not okay. And there's also places that she can get support. She knows all this, but she doesn't always do it. So why is that? <clears throat> and that's because Mia Mia, like the fish in the pond, does not live in isolation. Mia Mia lives in an area, in an environment where she's surrounded by other people and other settings. She's surrounded by what is around her, about the, by the infrastructure. She can only wash her hands if water is available, if water and soap are available. 
she is influenced by her friends. What do her friends say? What do her friends expect her to do? Uh, what does she feel she needs to do to fit in with her friends? She's influenced by her family, what her family does, the, the routines and the habits and the beliefs of her family. And then of course, she is influenced by the broader community. So those in the community, it could be the local leaders, the religious leaders, it could be the services that are available in that community. It could be how information is available and distributed in that community. So Mia Mia, like all of us, uh, lives in an ecosystem where what she thinks, feels and does is very much influenced by everyone and everything around her. And this is what we need to take into consideration when we do social and behavior change interventions. And this sort of example that I've just uh, described about Mia Mia um, is um, kind of explained through a diagram that you may, many of you may be familiar with, which is called the social ecological model. This social ecological model basically tells us that what we do as individuals is very much influenced by um, factors at every level, from the individual level through to interpersonal, community services and policy and social. So when we talk about individual determinants of behavior or individual factors that influence what we do, we are talking about things like knowledge, uh, beliefs, values, <clears throat> risk perception, how, how worried are we about doing something or not doing something, self-efficacy, which basically means how confident do we feel about performing the behaviors that we know we should perform. So there are many factors at the individual level that affect whether we do or don't do something. And that in turn is influenced by the interpersonal level. So that is our, those closest to us, our family and our friend mostly. Um, so what do they do? What do they expect us to do? Uh, what do they believe in? That will, believe, will influence how, what we will believe and do. Similarly, at the community, we are talking about things like um, the local leaders, the services that are available, how accessible are they, um, how, um, how friendly are they to, to, to people who need to use them? Um, how accessible is information in our community? What is the narrative that is being promoted in the community about certain behaviors and practices? What are the expectations from community members about what we do? That will influence what we do as well. And ultimately, of course, the policies uh, in, in a country will affect how we um, it all trickles down to our individual behaviors. So uh, policies, laws, regulations, and also uh, broader things like the norms, the cultural norms, the religious norms, the social norms that are very much ingrained in the society will affect how we ultimately behave. So this is just an example to illustrate how social and behavior change happens and a very much the approach that UNICEF uses is really trying to understand how behavior is influenced across these levels, across these layers, and what are the factors in these layers that we need to try and influence to change behaviors. And I will illustrate this a little more by giving you an example uh, around mine action in Myanmar. Um, now, as you all know, Myanmar is um, affected by, uh, by landmines, um, mostly uh, it's uh, nine states out of 14 that still have um, mines and um, an unexploded remnants of war. And um, the, the, the majority of the work that has been done in Myanmar has been around uh, EORE delivered at the community level through different groups and generally using a toolkit uh, that is um, delivered by a trained facilitator. And these trained facilitators are people in the community. 
And uh, very much like what uh, Laramie was explaining earlier, the focus of what was being done was very much on uh, information challenge uh, sharing and building knowledge. So it was very much around giving knowledge, uh, but this doesn't necessarily help us having knowledge as we've seen in Miamia's case, having knowledge is not necessarily enough for us to take action. And while the, um, the, the facilitation and the uh, groups uh, using uh, the, these mine action toolkit were uh, engaging, there were questions as to the impact and, has how, and to the reach and how much are we actually affecting behavior and uh, ensuring that people take protective action. So to try and understand that better, a uh, CAP survey, a Knowledge uh, Attitudes and Practices survey, was conducted with uh, UNICEF's partners, uh, Danish Church Aid, in selected areas. And um, this was uh, a CAP survey that also included some uh, qualitative areas to really try and pin down uh, what were the drivers of behaviours and what were the barriers to adopting protective behaviours. And the findings highlighted some very interesting um, areas that needed to be addressed. Uh, for example, it was very clear from the CAP that we needed to devise some locally driven and locally owned processes. So the whole change had to come from the community. It wasn't uh, an imposition of, you know, this is what you need to do. It was very much needed to be a participatory process uh, involving the local community. We also noted that there was a low risk perception among affected communities, so that while we, you know, we educated them and told them all about the risks, the risk perception was low. So that meant that people did not feel that they themselves or their loved ones could actually be affected by this problem. So obviously they didn't take protective action because they didn't think it concerned them. Um, there, it became clear also that there was quite a lot of misinformation around landmines, the use of landmines. So uh, people heard different things from different sources and they were not clear about what was factual. Uh, there was also confusion around the protective behavior. So what did someone have to do to protect themselves? That was also unclear. We also noted that, noticed that there were lower levels about the risks of man, landmines uh, among women and children. So that really highlighted some of the group or the audience segments that we had to target through our intervention. Um, we also saw that there was a need for open discussion and for accessible information, that this didn't seem to be the case in the community. It was only through certain groups, certain locations that information was accessible and we needed to really expand that. Um, and then there was also a need to support parents of adults to discuss this with their children, to discuss a mine risk with their children. And uh, that was a need really expressed by uh, parents and adults. So based on all these findings, we really had kind of a roadmap as to what we needed to do. So what the CAP told us, it told us, first of all, what our messaging so should focus on. We understood that we need to uh, look at risk perception and really get people to feel that they too could be affected. We also noticed that we needed to, to clarify behaviors, both uh, clarify information, but also clarify protective behaviors. So a call to action needed to be very, very clear, uh, really explain this is what you need to do. Uh, we also, uh, the, the CAP also told us who we should target and who should, we should focus on most. Obviously, the, the, one of the issues that we have with Mine Action is that we go into EORE, is that we go into communities and we just target everyone, whoever comes along. But a bit more focus really helps us to um, pinpoint and really uh, work with those that can make the biggest change. And we noticed that it was women, children and parents that we had to focus most from the CAP. This was really highlighted from the CAP. And then finally, um, it also gave us some insights on how to reach them. It was clear from the results on the CAP, from the CAP survey that we needed to bring the community along with us, that we really needed to work together with them to identify solutions and create very much an open dialogue and open communication around uh, mine risk in the community. 
So armed with this knowledge, uh, we started developing um, a more comprehensive intervention and we came along um, up with a three-pronged approach. Uh, and this had, on the one hand, we had uh, mass media uh, to uh, clarify the message for identified audience group. Um, we had a prong that was around community engagement to develop locally driven solutions. And then finally, uh, upstream advocacy. So working with uh, local parliament and local parliamentarians uh, to do upstream advocacy. What I focused on most uh, and will talk a bit more about are really the first two prongs. So the mass media component and the community engagement. And the idea of these three pronged approach is very much what Mathieu was also uh, explaining uh, earlier was looking at reinforcing messages across different channels at different platforms. So that if someone hears the message uh, from the radio, uh, they, this message will then be reinforced again in community engagement activities, and then again in upstream advocacy. So very much a continual message reinforcement, which can really help people to retain the information and to also um, become motivated to take action. So in terms of the approaches selected, um, we created a, a series of message maps for each of the audience group with very factual information and a clear call to action. So message maps are basically um, just a series of messages that answer specific questions. Um, we have a question that we think might uh, be um, in, uh, important for the community. So what are uh, um, landmines, for example? And then we have um, a short answer and then supporting information and a very clear call to action. So what to do to avoid it. So we developed these for each audience groups and this became something that helped us support all interventions, all activities, making sure that we were all working from the same key messages and the same supporting information so that we would have clarity across messages and that communities would not get misinformation or get confused. And using these, um, through these, we use them to develop radio spots, but we also use them to conduct a symposium with uh, radio um, and media, with the media, but mostly with radio, local radio stations. And what we did in this symposium, uh, and this is an interesting thing to do when maybe uh, you're limited on means, um, when you don't have a lot of money to develop a big, huge campaign, we brought the radios together and uh, we had a half day with them explaining to them um, what the risks and what really was mine action and what was the situation in Myanmar. And we brought across also um, real examples about how mines have affected people's lives. So we really gave a humane uh, face to this uh, problem, problem, this issue that can be very dry. It's not just about facts and figures and people who are in numbers uh, who are affected and victims. It's really about real lives and how these real lives are affected. Uh, and this was done to try and inspire radios to go away and do their own thing. And they did, and it was really impressive. Some radios went away and they developed a whole radio drama around um, uh, landmines and people being affected by them. Others developed debates, q and question and answers. It was really a way of getting the media more actively engaged so that they would constantly be reinforcing the messages. And they had our message maps so that we were sure that the information that they used, however creatively they put it together, would be guided by these key messages that were always the same ones. And then finally, we also uh, engaged communities more actively in our education, in developing um, solutions to the problem, identifying um, who should be the people that need to be uh, informed straight away from uh, if, if uh, an ordinance is identified or something suspicious is identified. How do we, um, where, where do we go to? Uh, what do we do when we see it? And so on. So really bringing communities together to identify solutions. And through these approaches, we assured that the same messages would be reinforced and that communities became very much engaged in the issue themselves so that they could all support each other and uh, take more um, um, 
locally driven approaches and uh, work more as a community and have more collective efficacy in order to um, ensure that this, you know, that people would have the abilities to take action to avoid uh, mine, um, mines and uh, other uh, unexploded remnants of war. So this is really the approach that we took and I'm available for any questions later. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alessia. Uh, I think your example of, of the girl Mia Mia, I, I won't get that out of my head. I feel like I know her from your story. I think you've also really shown how, you know, behavior change is, is a, a word that's being used increasingly in explosive ordnance risk education, but the tools for it are actually not too far from our fingertips. So help, thank you for bringing that to life. Um, I'd like to also remind everyone that you can post questions uh, in the Q&A at any point. We've already had uh, one question answered by a panelist in it. Um, now is time to kind of move away a bit from mine action. I'm pleased to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Fiona Terry, who heads the ICRC's Center for Operational Research and Experience. She has over two decades of experience in humanitarian operations, and she'll be speaking on ICR's experience with initiatives informed by behavioral science. Over to you, Fiona. Thanks very much, Caitlin. Hi, everyone. Um, Sorry, I am trying to share my screen. Of course, it always works in rehearsals perfectly. Okay, so, so I'm going to, as Caitlin suggested, I'm going to talk a little bit more through, through another angle than, than mine action education, although the ICRC does do a lot of work on, in this area. Um, but, I, but since if uh, many of you are embarking upon this for the first time, thought, we thought it might be very interesting to just sort of share the exploration that the ICRC has done um, around, around the relevance of behavioral science to our work and, and what it has taught us. Um, so basically I'm going to do that through talking about two projects, one which uses nudges in a project in Pakistan and the other which uses behavioral change theory to help us better influence behavior. Just as Alicia said, so much of this is about influencing behavior. So we've taken a two-pronged um, approach to try to understand what this means to the ICRC. So for those of you who don't know the ICRC, um, the, its mandate is to prevent and alleviate the suffering of victims of armed conflict. And as this slide shows, we aim to persuade those carrying weapons to fight in accordance with international humanitarian law, being the Geneva Conventions, but also other laws. Um, and uh, that, that are aiming to reduce or mitigate or prevent civilian harm. We also engage in a lot of bilateral discussions with authorities of different countries um, to ensure that international standards of treatment are respected, say in prisons around the world. And so an enormous amount of our work is in fact aimed at trying to influence behavior. Therefore, when I first read the the 2015 Mind, Society and Behaviour Report of the World Bank, which if you haven't read it, I really thoroughly recommend this. It's a fascinating read and with so many insights into behavioural science, it was really the first time I had come across this, I was very inspired and I thought, surely we can use some of these insights in our work to try to, to think through, um, you know, how are we actually trying to influence behaviour through our dialogue with these different armed actors and, and what more could we be doing. So that then prompted me to look around and I did a short course, a nudging course in Copenhagen, and uh, which was very, very interesting where it was quite strong on the theory behind nudging and there are many different aspects to nudges which go beyond social norms. I mean, social norms are a very important one. And as I will come back to, I think probably the most important one, as Alicia suggested also in, in our line of work. But, you know, there were other, there were whole other aspects of how our brain works, what it sees, what, how it reacts to different things. And I thought these were very interesting. But the sort of nudges they were telling us about successfully doing was, um, you know, was getting smokers to move away from the, the door at the airport in, in Copenhagen um, and, you know, using fluorescent colouring to attract attention to rubbish bins in order to get people to put, you know, rubbish in the bin. 
you've probably, well, many of you men will have seen that there are, is a fly painted in the, in the urinal in, in some airports around the world, which is all about attracting attention and reducing spillage in the, uh, in the urinals. Um, there are other nudges which uh, have successfully got people at a conference to eat more fruit and less cake, um, just by being about where you position things on the table and how easily you give access to things. So, and then there's another one, of course, in, in Britain, which was very successful in trying to get people, taxpayers to pay their taxes on time using sort of social norms. Um, and this, this one spoke to me, having said in many, many hotels, that it's been shown that a, the, a message in, in a hotel room that says, you know, please reuse your towel, it's, you know, it's good for the environment, is not nearly as effective as saying, you know, in room 801, you know, 75% of the people who have stayed here over the last year used that reused their towel. And again, you know, leaning on social norms and uh, this is a behavior they're expected of people staying in this room. So I thought all of that was extremely interesting, but I struggled a little bit in our field of trying to pr perhaps prevent violence and uh, um, and persuade authorities how it could relate to us. And I particularly wanted to find cross-cultural examples of, um, of nudges which have worked elsewhere. And so the one that most resonated with me was because I was I'm out of living in Kenya for a year. This is a Matatu, a, a minibus in uh, Nairobi. And minibuses have many fatal um, car accidents. The drivers are often driving very irresponsibly. I never got on my bike in Nairobi because I was too scared of, of matatus. But this was a very interesting, successful experiment that was done, whereby by putting a sign inside the matatu saying, um, if your driver is driving dangerously, speak up. They, the people that running this experiment, then of course tested the effect of this, very important in behavioral science, and through police records and insurance claims, worked out that the, the matatus that had this sign inside had far less fatal crashes than the ones that didn't. And so what this was doing was sort of providing, you know, creating a community inside the, the bus where, where they felt empowered to speak up and say something when their life was on the line, as opposed to just perhaps staying silent and just grinning and bearing it. So I found that this was really getting one step closer to what sort of things we might be interested in. So, but then um, I really thought, okay, we can have lots of experts come and talk to this, us about this in, 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 in ICRC headquarters in, in Geneva, but I felt it would be even more interesting if we were able to actually start our own experiment or our own pilot project in the field. So we put a call for proposals out to behavioral science um, consultancies, and we teamed up with a group called Policy Analytics, which is based out of Zurich. And, um, and we chose to run um, a, a project in two hospitals, one in Karachi and one in Peshawar, which are aimed at um, reducing or mitigating violence against health staff in these two hospitals. Now, why we chose these hospitals in Pakistan was because we have a really great team of people working on the health care in danger um, campaign in Pakistan who had already done, done a baseline survey of one hospital in Karachi. And they had found and really looked at sort of violence against health staff and who were the main perpetrators. And they found that it was often the caretakers who were bringing the patients in that were the main perpetrators of violence. And then they looked back a little bit further and why, why would this be? How could this be? And they realized that in fact, a lot of these incidents came through the frustration of ambulances being stuck in traffic because people were not moving away their ambulances from um, uh, on the road. So they, uh, so they ran themselves a communication campaign, which was all about getting people to give way to ambulances. And so they, sorry, I don't know if these are being directed at me. Are these being directed at me? Sorry, these uh, messages, because I'm not reading them if I'm talking. No, okay, cool, sorry. <laughs> so, so they ran a communication campaign around ambulances saying to everybody, give way to ambulances, there may be somebody you love inside. They observed an observational study, which is 
found an 18% decrease in, um, in hospitals, uh, in ambulances arriving late. So that was already a great start. So we decided to capitalize on that by going further and using that baseline and teaming up and looking at how could we further perhaps reduce violence against health staff in these two hospitals. Choosing two hospitals, one in Karachi and one in Peshawar, to also look at some of the local differences we may see uh, and what work, in what works and what doesn't work. So, so basically, the team teamed up with the hospital staff. We got ethics review uh, um, authorization, and we we went through all the process properly. And then the idea was to design and test behavioural interventions to re reduce violence against health staff. So they started off by doing some process mapping in the hospitals, focusing on specifically the emergency area to try to work out where could be these areas of tension, you know, geographically um, in the hospital. Then extensive surveys, more than 800 surveys in each hospital were carried out with, with patients, with, with caretakers, but also with all of the staff from the hospital director through to the janitor and interviews and focus groups discussions with all concerned. And then some, so then all the results got together, uh, were put together and then discussed in depth with the hospital staff. So everything Alicia and Matthew and everybody has said about involving people in this process is so incredibly important. Um, and so this was done and there were three areas that, um, that, that came out, that there was a lack of trust in hospital staff that there were inaccurate expectations of waiting times by the patients and their caretakers, and that social norms are critical areas to address from a behavioral perspective. So then they got together with everybody and, and you know, brainstormed over what sort of interventions could we possibly have to address those. These were then tested over six weeks. It was supposed to be tested over many months, but unfortunately the whole project got put back by COVID. We are actually um, completing our data collection in, in um, Karachi Hospital on the 7th of April, and we, we completed it in Peshawar this week. So it's really all very fresh. Um, and so we'll be looking at what were the, were the outcomes. But there were, there were three areas of social, of, uh, of behavioral interventions. This is one of them. This is a commitment that is made in the public domain. So firstly, we trialed a commitment in a private commitment where a hospital staff member would go up to a patient or caretaker as they came in and say to them, we commit as hospital staff to, um, to treat you with respect and in the best manner we possibly can. Will you commit to the same thing and treat us with respect? So this is basically what the commitment says. And so, there was one version which has been tested on its own, uh, which is a private commitment. This is the public commitment, where, as you see, people have agreed to it with a with a thumbprint, and it's much more in the public domain. So here again, we are we are looking at social norms and the role that that plays. And then the third intervention was about information, which of course has already been pointed out, very very important, an information desk in. And I would, I would say it was, it was proposed for both hospitals. Unfortunately, it was only Karachi that was able to do it because they were too worried about congestion around the information desk in Peshawar and the um, possibility of transmitting, uh, of COVID transmission. They only tested the information desk in, um, in Karachi. So I hope you'll all stay tuned because we hope that we will come out with a publication from this. We'll also come out with a you know, a very practical handbook about what we've learned from it. And then we were trying to think about what this means elsewhere and to what extent we can replicate this project in, in other places. And, and what do we think? Do we need to test different behavioral approaches? Do we think this is a good outcome? And all that is yet to be discovered by all of us. Okay, in the second part of exploration around behavioral science for us, I come back to the influencing the behavior of authorities or armed groups. And so we've been running through my research center an internal report where or an internal study research study where we set out to try to understand the quality of our dialogue with non-state armed groups and what do i mean by quality of dialogue i mean are we achieving what we're hoping to achieve through our dialogue and can we do things better using behavioral science to perhaps inform us so um so basically, we first also did a mapping um, 
how does pro how is the process of of dialogue where do we get the information from are we are we capitalizing on all the information at our disposal when we go and talk to a non-state arm group and in fact by doing so we discovered some very important findings which was that, that in fact the whole strategy in people's heads about how they are aiming to change behavior was very much more implicit than explicit. And a big problem of this was that most people had thought about it, but it wasn't written down. And when you don't write things down, of course, you can't pass it on to the next delegate, but also you can't really monitor your progress against it because if it's all in your head, of course, things in our head change. So, um, so basically that was one important finding that we need to have an absolutely explicit theory of change, which is written down and documented which also points out the assumptions for each stage of what do we think we're doing next on based on what assumption. And, uh, and then we are able to also monitor in a much better way, did we, did we reach this, this particular objective we were going for with this unit of this armed group or not? Because it's obviously very, very specific. Um, and are we capitalizing enough on, on the data we have? And we discovered that no, in the ICE, TRC was still fighting against a, a compartmentalization of different tasks among different units. And we're not using enough, for example, the um, assessment done by the ECOSEC, the economic security team, perhaps a group, a village had just been displaced and, and the, 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 the needs assessment was done. Um, and perhaps the group had been displaced by an armed group, but we're not making that link. We're not using the needs assessment to tell the armed group this is what were the consequences of your actions. And as we know, we need to use more than just international humanitarian law. We need to use norms. We need to talk about consequences. We need to be more persuasive and, and diversify our areas of persuasion. So that was, that was the, the first part. In the second part, we um, have introduced the behavior change wheel to our teams. And so this is a tool which helps us to identify areas which may be more conducive to working on in our dialogue or in the behavior that we want to change. So it's based on the idea that there are three main drivers to behavior. The first is the capability. Does the armed group have the capability to change the behavior if they wanted to? Okay, the next is opportunity. Do they have the opportunity to change their behavior. And the third is the motivation. Do they have the motivation? So we may find that in an analysis of a non-state armed group, yes, it's got the capacity to change its behavior. It's got plenty of opportunities to change its behavior. Oh, the problem is the motivation. So then what do we need to work on as the ICRC in terms of motivation to try to change this behavior? And, um, and so we were, we really, went through so many minutes of meeting and interviews with different people who are working in this domain. And we tried to come up with all the different sort of things that we have to think of in non-state armed groups that go into each of these categories. Of course, it's very subjective about which category you put something into. I mean, if a, if a non-state armed group has a code of conduct that you can call upon, well, you might say, well, that's its capability to be able to act in accordance with its code of conduct. But you could easily also say, no, it's it's about the motivation. It wouldn't have written a code of conduct if it wasn't motivated to stick to it, et cetera. So it's a bit subjective at this point, and we're leaving it open to our teams to put what, where, if they don't have to necessarily follow our structure. But I think, you know, we just tried to point out to them that what we need to what what are the things that we need to understand about a non-state armed group or a government official because it's it's also adaptable across the field in order to work on the priorities and and the things we think we might be able to change as opposed to the things we can't. So just to take one example, because the other thing we did was we looked at the individual drivers, the group drivers, and the external factors all the way around. So in the inside, we've got individual drivers of behavior. These are the group drivers. And then the, uh, the outer layer is the external factors that we can't necessarily control, but perhaps we can influence. So just to give you the example of um, the capability. So at the, at, the low, at the individual level, we might ask the questions like, you know, does the NSAG member on the checkpoint, you know, know who we are as the ICRC and what we do? But also, does he or she have the autonomy to make a decision uh, to let us pass or hold us up? And so this 
does that tell us? What do we have to work on? At the group level, we need to understand how non-state armed groups operate. Many are very horizontal, others are very vertically organized. So how are orders communicated from the leadership to the fighters? Does the leadership have strict rules on who is a legitimate target and who is not? You know, what happens to a fighter who disobeys an order? All of this information is really important for us to be able to decide where we are going to lean in. And then at the external level, we might ask ourselves, does the NSAG have external sponsors? What kind of support they receive? Is the NSAG part of a wider network of armed groups such as Al-Qaeda or ISIS affiliates? Does the NSAG receive support from the diaspora? Could this be a channel of influence by finding you know, influential people in the diaspora? So based on this analysis, this delegation-wide analysis, not just in one sector, but across the board, you know, we are hoping to, you know, push a, well, persuade the ICRC first off, to, to really work on a strategy of influence, to forge one, you know, prioritizing the most harmful uh, behaviors and those behaviors that we think we can change, et cetera. So this is, again, again, it's quite new. This is just at the stage where we are just writing up the final version of the report right now. It will be an internal report. Um, I have to think through how much um, information could be shared with others, but definitely it's, um, it's a work in progress. And then we want to, you know, take it to the field and, and test it and work with, with different delegations to try to work on the strategy using behavioral science as our, as our theoretical framework. So I'll stop there and um, stop sharing and we'll be available for comments as well. Thank you very much, Fiona. I think it's really interesting to see already the overlap that we're seeing between the different presentations, uh, very different angles to, to behavioral science, bringing in the nudge theory, but also, you know, you're talking about these individual group levels and going uh, further outward. So I think they, they really build on each other well. So thank you for that presentation. Um, finally, uh, to introduce our last speaker, but certainly not least, um, Jamie Guth is a global health communications expert. She has been managing the COVID-19 risk communications product development at the World Health Organization since May 2020. And she'll be speaking about WHO's experience uh, institutionalizing behavioral insights. Thanks, Jamie. Hello, everyone, and thanks for having me. This has been really interesting listening to my colleagues and learning also from them. Um, I'm giving this presentation um, both on my behalf and also Elena Altieri, who is the lead for behavioral site in the Behavioral Insights Initiative at WHO. So first of all, I wanted to just share with you the, what the Behavioral Insights Initiative is. Um, we're very proud of it. It was launched last year by our Director General and it's supported by an external technical advisory group of global experts. So for the first time in the history of our organization, we have a central unit that's mainstreamed across the whole organization. And what it's doing is prioritizing the integration of behavioral insights from the planning and design phase and steering it away from just using it um, in the implementation phase. So just wanna go over the strategy of it. So we have this initiative, which as I said, is centralized and cross-cutting. We're staffing it with the right expertise. We have funding for seed funding for pilots, and we have a mandate to learn, innovate, and prove the concept, and a two-year work plan. So one of the things that we're looking at is that applying behavioral um, insights is about behaviors are really part of the problem and they're also part of the solution. So they, they uh, intersect. So what we reinforce is first of all, diagnosing the behavior. So who needs to perform a behavior? What needs to be done differently? And where and when will they do it? And then that informs the, the behavioral intervention. So now that we know what the barriers and the drivers are, what should the intervention do? Should it educate? persuade, incentivize, punish or cost, train, restrict, change the environment, provide a model or enable. Um, you've heard about some of these things um, in the previous two presentations. So what I'm trying to do is to take it up a level and look at it from a, an organizational perspective of how do we do this. So 
what I wanted to show you was just one small example, not small to us, but one example um, on vaccine acceptance. So um, this is a, a publication that was produced as a result of a study of looking at the drivers in vaccine acceptance. And what we found that I think are, is also applicable to your field is looking at the importance of creating that enabling environment. And you've heard a little bit about that in the first presentation. So for us, it's about making vaccination easy, quick, and affordable. It's not just about the messaging. Then the second one is about harnessing those social influences. So especially from the people who are trusted and are identified as leaders in those communities. And of course, the most important, or not the most important, but another important aspect is to increase the motivation. So how do we establish that open and transparent dialogue so people feel safe, they feel like they're honored? And how do we communicate openly about uncertainty and risks? We're not just talking about, oh, it's all gonna be great, or this is wonderful, or this is what to do. It's sharing those nuances and also about the safety and benefits of vaccination. So once again, could be applied to other areas. So now I wanna switch because I was asked to talk both about the behavioral science and then also about the community engagement. So our principles that communities are engaged, they're empowered and they're informed. And how do we do that? So we have four strategies. So we've got a circle. So I'm starting in the upper left-hand corner with the first one, which is to facilitate community-led responses. And the key word here is community-led. So this is, if it's an issue in the community, we want them to identify what the issue is and we're there to support them, but not to lead it. The second objective is to generate, to analyze and to use evidence. And to use evidence what? What kind of evidence? About the community's context, the community's capacities, the community's perceptions and the community's behaviors. It's not ours, it's theirs. The third objective is to reinforce the capacity, in our case, to control the uh, pandemic and mitigate its impacts, but obviously it can be adapted to other areas too. So what this means is we're not looking to come in, develop something, and then leave and it goes away. We want the capacity to be left there so that it can be used for other issues. And then the fourth objective is to be collaborative. We can't do this alone. No one organization can do it alone. So we work very closely with partners like UNICEF. Um, you know, there are so many partners that are already on the ground. So it's really important to do that so that we increase the quality, we harmonize and optimize and figure out how to integrate it all together. So one of the things we look at is what kind of a community we're looking at and working in. We all know each community is very different. So these are some of the questions that we ask as we're going in. What are the beliefs, the practices, the culture? Are we working with hard to reach or mobile populations? Are they underserved and how are they underserved? Are they rural or urban? Who are the key influential leaders? Um, many times they're religious leaders or other types of um, uh, structural, structural organizations that can help us identify those leaders. Um, what are those structures and systems to engage? What kinds of communication channels to use that are appropriate? Sometimes, you know, we heard a mention of chalkboards, radio, um, print materials. We have to really target it toward that, com that community which also affects the types of messaging and which stakeholders and partners to reach out to. So this community mapping, why do we do it? Well, first of all, to help us appropriately target the messages and the interventions so we really know what they are looking for and what they need. It also helps us avoid conflict. <laughs> you know, if we're adapting it to that community's needs and we're working with these partners, we're not getting into a conflict situation or at least reducing the, 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 the possibility of doing that. It also helps us understand the nuances within the community. Um, the first presentation was great at identifying all those different nuances of that little girl and all the things that she had to understand, we need to understand also in order to help that community. 
It also, by understanding the community, helps to make it all inclusive and acceptable. It ensures community ownership and it releases control. We're not in control, they are in control and they see that from the very beginning. So um, I talked about partnership. So we are part of what's called the collective service, which started um, in the last year as part of the COVID-19 pandemic. And so we're partnering with IFRC, with UNICEF and GORN to look across all of our organizations as to how we are managing the pandemic. What are the resources that we have? What, is the, what are the data that we have? Let's share it. Can we have combined data sources? Can we develop um, collective guidance on this? And so this was one of the products that has come out of that um, process. So we have um, a publication called 10 Steps to Community Readiness, which was just released within the last month. It's available in English, French, Spanish, Portuguese, and shortly Russian. Um, the links on the right show you both the link to the full publication, which has a lot of information on it. I'm just going to go over the, the top, I mean, the, the steps, but at a very high level. And then there's also the link to the collective service that you can find out more information because there are many um, data sources and uh, resources that might be of interest to you and our viewers. So the 10 steps are da -da -da -da, uh, the first one make decisions about the people with the people. And this is a word, the word with is a key thing in everything that we do. You know, we just can't do it separately. The second is to maintain and strengthen trust through both formal and informal connections. Lots of different ways you can do that. We wanna do it in as many ways as possible. The third is to listen more and talk less. Good lesson in life for all of us, isn't it? <laughs> Especially when we were talking, when we're with our the key people in our lives. The fourth is use data for decision making and course correction. You've heard the expression, you know, if you don't measure it, you don't know. Um, we need to know. We need to be able to track and monitor what's working, and be able, and that we can use to adapt and make it better. The fifth step is plan, 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 once again, with the people. Uh, the sixth is let the people measure the success. So oftentimes we develop this plan and we, okay, this is how we're going to measure it. And then we apply it and measure it. And then we realize mm, um, maybe that measure wasn't as useful as we thought. But if we ask the people and they're the ones who've developed, this is what we need and this is how we wanna do it. They're going to tell us and we'll have a much more accurate measurement of the success of the program. The seventh is, I hope this is good news to you, is to hire and empower more risk communication and community engagement expertise because all this does need to be supported by people who know all these fields and um, the more that we can all get together and share this information and learn from each other, the better. Uh, the eighth is to build capacity and develop skills that go beyond, in our case, COVID-19, one specific issue, um, so that it can be applied generally across public health. The ninth is to manage the infodemic. So as you know, uh, the infodemic is really huge for COVID-19, lots of misinformation and disinformation in there. And so that's one of um, a growing and key area of our work. And 10 is to start the drumbeat together. So um, what I would like to do now is to give you an example of something on community engagement that we've done on reducing the transmission of COVID-19. So we've developed a lot of information, a lot of products. Many of them are digital and, and are more difficult or if not impossible to put into a community setting. So we've taken some of these materials and worked with our partners on developing a family toolbox that would be facilitated by trained um, community risk and uh, or community engagement or risk communicators at the local level. So um, what you see on the left is the cover of this publication and what it has is a number of products that can be adapted so they can be printed and used as handouts 
or some of this content can be written on a whiteboard or a flip chart, or you know, there's a couple different ways that people can use it depending on the resources of their setting. So in the middle is just one of the sheets in there that explains transmission in a pretty simple way so people can, um, so that they can help people understand that. Um, and then what we've done is developed a couple different um, products that can help people at the community level understand it better, more interactive tools. So on the left is a, a series of questions for people and families, like who in your family might be exposed to it, to COVID on a daily basis? Who interacts with higher numbers? Who does the shopping? Who do you have guests in your home? Do you visit people outside your household? So it's getting at, trying to get, give them a sense of understanding where, who may be at, at higher risk very specific to their situation. Then on the right, um, what we've done is we've identified or we've produced a lot of content about the three different factors that affect transmission, location, proximity, and time. And so what we've done is develop questions to be asked in the community on each of these situations. Like for example, in location, where are you going? Is it outside or inside? Is Does it have ventilation? Are there hand washing facilities. All this is based on the content that is taught at the beginning to once again, help them understand their, their risk. And then this is the last slide that I have, which is um, two more products within this transmission kit. One is writing a family pack. So now that they've gone through all this analysis and they figured it out, we ask them to think about which members of the household are most vulnerable that they've determined. And then you decide who will be the educator staying informed about the risk in the community, who will be the shopper carrying out errands, who will be the caregiver and other roles. And then to identify high risk activities that you're doing and maybe some that you might be willing to give up during this time as a result of the risk that it presents. So engaging them at a different level. One is about learning about it. Second is about identifying behaviors. A third is committing to doing something. And then something, a fun activity that they could be using within their family, apart from the facilitator is a game about COVID-19. And these are cards that they can be printed up and cut out. So very simple, or they could create their own versions, event cards and action cards where they can do different scenarios. Um, so I put in this slide uh, the contact information to Marzal because the one who's been working on this to do it. But the the point that I would end with is I've been just so impressed with listening to these presentations and and being a part of this because all of us together need to be working on this and we can all learn. So Matthew and team, thank you very much for allowing us to be a part of it. And I'm really looking forward to the conversation that we have now so that we can learn from you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jamie. It, I'm absolutely fascinating to see, see um, what you're working on and these infographics. And I think you've put a lot down on paper that we talk about but haven't necessarily formalized. So it's really useful to see. Um, I also just want to thank all the panelists again for your presentations, um, because I, I think it's not too often that we get people from all different sectors together. You know, we speak different languages often, um, and to have us in the same room talking about something that actually we're all working on, as you said, Jamie, um, is really a powerful moment. So thank you. I'd like to invite all of the panelists um, back um, for a, a few questions. So we have about 15 minutes before we have to close. Um, and I'd like to start with a, a, a round for everyone. Um, what would be the, the one, one or two key lessons learned with regards to social behavior change communication that you would share with the audience? And uh, since you just finished, Jamie, I'll start back with you. Okay. Um... I have two points. One is to establish partnerships at the very beginning and to nurture those relationships throughout. Without partnerships, we just can't do anything. And the second one is to be humble about it. Um, what we have learned is that what we think is important or should be 
developed or responded to is not always what the community thinks. So ask the community, let the community lead. Um, those are the two most important things that we have learned very humbly. <laughs> Thanks. Fiona? Well, I definitely agree with Jamie's points, but also I would add, um, I think that really understanding the social norms and understanding a uh, deep understanding of the community, which of course implies that, of course, we need to absolutely engage with them is, is paramount. Thank you. Uh, Alessia? Thanks. Um, I think that uh, a very important point is, um, and it reinforces what Fiona and Jamie said, it's around understanding. And I think it's really, um, a re uh, helpful to do an initial assessment to try and understand what the drivers of behaviors are. Sometimes we go into communities thinking that we uh, know what they need to know and it's just uh, it, once they know they'll know what, what to do. But we've seen from several examples that were illustrated today that it's not always the case uh, that they might a know already and b even if they once they know they don't do anything about it. So it's very important to, to spend some time doing a bit of an analysis to try and understand what the drivers of behaviors are across the social ecological model like um, we, we demonstrated. So that would be my recommendation to, to invest in that which often gets neglected. Thanks, Alessia. I did find it interesting that in every presentation, the word mapping came was used on the slides. Um, Matthew, uh, end with you. Yeah, I would uh, just build on what um, Jamie and Alessia and Fiona just mentioned, and as maybe what we've seen with the, Afghan the, the example of Afghanistan is maybe have the courage to review existing practices um, and say, okay, how are we doing? Is it fit for purpose? Do we have a theory of change? Are we actually uh, achieving the desired you know, behavior change or impact, get the buy-in from our management, but also to get the buy-in from donors to understand that if you want to go you know, adopt an SBCC lens, um, it needs momentum building, it needs a bit more resource and a bit more time um, because it's a bottom-up process as we mentioned. So that would probably be my tip. And the, the last one, sorry, would be um, to have the process driven by the National Mine Action Authority uh, and have it embedded into, ideally embedded into the you know, multi-year mine action strategy on the you know, specific goal for risk education and have it mentioned there. Thanks. Thanks, Mathieu. Um, so a lot of the questions that have been being posed in the Q&A have actually already been answered by our panelists who are busy multitasking, so thank you for that. Um, one, one of them related to the COVID-19 pandemic, and so I actually want to address this one to Alessia and Fiona, uh, not to Jamie. Um, Matt, you shared in it already, um, so there's some resources that the Explosive Ordnance Risk Education Advisor Group has developed related to the COVID-19 pandemic. But I want to ask both of you in your work, um, did the pandemic have to shift anything in, in what you were doing um, for Fiona for these interventions that you've mentioned and Alessia um, in your wider communications for development work? Um, so what impact did that have and how did you adjust? I'll go first because mine's probably much shorter, but yes, it delayed our project by more than a year. Obviously, we could not have data collectors in a hospital just collecting data for us and putting them at risk by being in a you know a place quite exposed to covid plus the hospitals were overwhelmed I mean they're just maybe possibly entering their third wave now in Pakistan so we've had already two waves and so we had to do this stopping and starting uh, and that's cut down unfortunately the amount of time that we were able to test our interventions so it has affected the scientific validity of our study but nevertheless we think we have we think it's still you know going to be okay and uh but i'll let you know because we still don't have the data in yet <laughs> i'll go next then um so uh, i don't work now in mine action since covid hit i've been working in other areas but the approaches as we said are very similar so we're talking about engaging with communities while there are some approaches that are that are not effective like mass media for example uh, the community engagement component is very much affected by by covid and by the social distancing and physical distancing restrictions that are there um, so in our programming uh, we've um, 
shifted a lot of the activities. Uh, we've in, depending on the setting, obviously this is uh, not applicable to all settings, uh, but in some settings it is possible to use uh, technologies, digital technologies. And very much my recommendation is, and what we've tried to do is very much to try and ensure a two-way communication and an engagement, even through digital technologies. Um, so uh, making sure that there's questions, that there is support available, that there is a two-way communication. It's not the same as a small group discussion, but you ensure that you do have a two-way communication. Uh, we've also shifted uh, some uh, of the activities, for example, some of the uh, groups and um, training of, uh, of staff or, or facilitators, mobilizers that we were doing um, in groups has now shifted uh, over the radio. So uh, radio programs training um, health uh, workers, for example, or um, health mobilizers or community mobilizers. So we tried to create um, different channels for reaching communities and people. Some cases, uh, WhatsApp groups have been built up, Viber groups, depending on what is the technology that operates in a particular area. Um, being very aware also of the limits uh, of these uh, technologies and how some groups may be further uh, excluded. So that's also very important to, to acknowledge. And that's why in some cases we've gone through the radio. So we've had discussions through the radio, which are less two way, but at least the information continues going. Um, and then in other cases, it was possible, it is still possible to do uh, groups spread out sitting together but being spread out so it's really trying to to identify what are the the solutions available in your setting thank you both i think it's really interesting ah yes um so jamie i'll come to you um alessia you mentioned two-way communication digital and i think that's an excellent um plug to actually stay tuned um everyone for our next webinar in two weeks which is going to be ongoing digital and i hope that we can bring in elements to that discussion about how to encourage a two-way communication not just a one-way jamie yes it's not on this but i was just checking on the q a and i noticed some um comments about uh risk perception and this is actually an important um, area. And we've been working very hard at it because what we realized early on was that you can't just say to people, do this, do that. So our whole campaign is on know your risk, lower your risk. But essentially, you decide. You, we give you the tools to understand what the risk is and you judge it for yourself because the risk changes moment by moment during the day, when you leave your, your house, when you go to see a friend, if you decide to go to a friend, and you are best in charge of, of, of making that, that of, of determining that balance of risk and where you want to take the risk and where you don't want to take the risk according to your own personal scenario. So I don't know how this relates. I mean, certainly if the consequences of that, are much more serious with mines, you don't want kids going up to mines and things. So I don't know exactly, but from a, even from the COVID perspective where people could die, although fewer people would die from exposure to it. Um, we, it's about honoring people's ability to make their own risk um, assessment. And the point is to give them the tools and the information and to know that we have that we believe in them, you know, that we trust them to make that, those decisions when they do that it goes a long way to building the trust and the credibility in the community. Thank you, Jamie. I think that's an excellent intervention uh, to make um, an endpoint to be hitting on. I'd like to ask one last question of everyone in, uh, in a lightning round um, before we end. So the whole idea behind this webinar is that it's been a view from other sectors. Um, so I'd really like to hear what one tip you would give to practitioners in explosive ordnance risk education um, who are only starting perhaps to explore behavior change approaches. What would be the one tip that you would give them? Uh, and let's start back again with Matthew. Oh, I would definitely say, as others have said, it's uh, the, the value of partnering with non-mine action organizations, uh, you know, as BCC, um, Expert, other organization in public health, RCCE uh, networks. Um, 
you know, to feed into our own thinking, but also to document what we do um, and share it, share it more systematically amongst practitioners. Thanks, Matt. Fiona? Um, I guess I would suggest expanding the the domain because I mean, behavioral science is so rich in so many aspects. And I think it's really an interesting, it's really an interesting journey to really go into it. So I would definitely say anyone who hasn't read the World Bank's um, 2015 report should read it. And I think it just can spark people's imaginations into, into ways that we can go beyond perhaps just communication and messages and really try to tackle other, you know, as, as others have said, safer behavior, et cetera, around that. So I would definitely um, encourage you all to, to dive a bit more deeply. Thanks, Fiona. Uh, Jamie? I agree with what's been said. I would say that if you're new and you're just starting off in this field, what could really help you is to figure out what is that change you're trying to create and figure out one measure to figure out if it worked, one measure for your, for your interaction, because then that will give you the knowledge to know whether it worked and to build off of that or to go in a different direction. It's the data that you need back to be able to continue in the field get one data point that's going to help you move forward. Interesting tip. Thanks, Jamie. And Alessia. Thanks. Um, and obviously, I agree with everything that has been said. I would add to it that um, it's linked to what I said earlier about lessons learned, uh, that we need to do an assessment to ensure that you know the communities that you're working with, the behaviors you're trying to change, and the drivers of those behaviors. And uh, in your approaches, uh, make sure that you reinforce your messages across different channels. We often tend to use just one approach, thinking that it's enough, uh, but I would really recommend uh, the use of multiple channels, multiple ch uh, platforms to reinforce uh, messages and engaging communities to do that. Thank you very much. I think this has been a really insightful uh, conversation for myself. Um, I would really like to thank all of our participants for joining in, to our panelists for your contributions. I'd also really like to thank my colleague Ines Issa, who has been quietly here, um, but certainly essential uh, in the background for, for keeping this webinar running smoothly. Um, so thank you. You've all prompted really new thinking, fresh ideas, solid inspiration, and I hope that we can take this away as, as good food for thought. Uh, we will be sharing the recording of this webinar as soon as it's available, um, and we'll also be sharing answers to some of the questions that we perhaps weren't able to answer during our time here. And finally, we hope to see you all on the 14th of April for the second webinar of this series, which will be dedicated to dig digital innovations. We'll have panelists from sectors who will be showing exciting tools and approaches. So see you then, and thank you all.